Hello everyone and welcome to the final week of 2021 streaming from Atomic Mass Games and Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm Will Schick, excited to be here with you as we enter our final week before we kind of all go on holiday break. Uh, we'll be back with more content tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific and then our final game stream of the year on Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, this will be our last MCP stream for 2021 though, so I'm excited that you're here with us. And of course we have a doozy for you today. BK unveiled the last of the mutant releases, which we've tried to keep under wraps as best we could for a little bit of an end of year surprise. And that is X-23 and Honey Badger, the Wolverine uh, daughters, clone daughters, however you want to look at them. Uh, an important part of the Wolverine family. So I'm very excited to be able to get some paint on uh, Laura here, and we're going to have some fun, we're going to chat, just hang out as we celebrate kind of the end of the cycle. I've got a couple of announcements to make as well, uh, which we'll talk about concerning Vibranium Heist and Infinity War, the organized play kits which released last year. Uh, I'm really excited to let you all know that by the end of this week, maybe even after this stream, I'm not entirely sure how fast BK is putting this stuff up, uh, there will be print and play versions of all those game materials for folks to download and be able to play with. So if you joined MCP after those kits became available or you never had the chance to play at a store uh, with those kits, you can now get all of the game content from them and start playing them in your house, in your LGS, with your friends, whatever you want to do. Um, and that's going to be something that's going to be rolling forward with all of the organized play kits going forward is uh, sometime after their release, typically about a year or a little bit more, 12 to 18 months. We'll be releasing them as print and play uh, materials for the game components only so that players who miss out or want to add those to their collection and didn't have a chance to do that will always have that archive of um, awesome game modes and new game experiences that you can bring into Marvel Crisis Protocol. So Vibranium Heist and Infinity War are going to be the first ones. I'm very excited to watch people get their hands on it, especially new players who might have missed out uh, on being able to experience it in the store. And of course, everything's pretty wonky with the world. Um, so just having this opportunity to be able to support our great game stores as well as uh, make sure all of our players have all of the materials to enjoy their Marvel Crisis Protocol content to the fullest. Really important to us, and I think that this is going to be a great way to kind of unify both and get everybody what they want, uh, and still make those kits kind of special because it's going to be how you're going to get them in print. With that said, uh, let's get this camera off of me and get it onto the star of our show, which is X-23. I'm going to bring my light over. Illuminate my subject a little bit here. So this is Laura Kinney. The all new, all different Wolverine, although this version of her, she is back in her X-23 uh, outfit. So kind of to, for those who are aware of the character or know the comic kind of roots of her, um, this, is, this is after Logan uh, returns from the grave uh, and retakes the mantle of Wolverine. And so um, she stops being Wolverine and she kind of becomes X-23. Uh, she lives in an apartment with um, Gabby, which is Honey Badger, and they go on a lot of adventures. They work with the X-Men. Uh, with X-Force and the Hickman stuff, all of that. They wound up on Krakoa. A uh, really great pair. And honestly, one of the runs that I fell in love with these characters about uh, quite a bit. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, when I say last of the mutant wave, I mean the ones that have been revealed so far. So the Colossus, uh, Magic, who else is in there? Juggernaut, all of those good folks. So I kind of completes the wave. Obviously, there will be more mutants down the road. Uh, there are so many mutants left to do. So much good stuff. But this is Laura and uh, Gabby are the last two from the wave that was initially shown off during Mini Stravaganza. Uh, but never fear, there are definitely more mutants in the works and on the way. It'd be hard to uh, touch every corner of the Marvel Universe without doing that. I'm just looking at my paint options here, trying to decide where I want to go. I think I'm going to start, because we've got a lot of black on this concert, we're going to start with our Halder Blue, as usual. I like this as my undertone to my black. And it is the last MCP stream of the year, so if I didn't use Halder Blue, uh, that would be an incredibly missed opportunity. So obviously one of the big things... I have to remember, it's black on the outside, white on the inside. There's a couple different versions of the costume. I always get them confused. Um, so, of course, you know, as clones of, of Logan and Wolverine, Gabby and Laura do share similar, uh, similar sets of abilities with the Wolverine. Um, they do bring a lot of different stuff to the table. 
one of the really fun parts about their design was kind of working the idea of them being sisters and their close bond, uh, which is really featured heavily in several of the runs that they're in, but um, very specifically in the X-23 run that happened post uh, the, what was it, the Infinity War? I think the Infinity War run. The one where Gamora gets the Infinity Gauntlet and causes all kinds of problems, and there's the Infinity Warps and all this stuff. Um, I think that one was called Infinity War. There are so many Infinity titles, it's difficult to keep track of them at times, especially when it's been a couple years since I read it. But, um, so they do have some nice synergy on the table together. Uh, Laura and Wolverine do have um, some nice nods to their relationship as well through Team Tactic cards. But overall, you know, they do what Wolverines do. They have healing factors. They have claw slash attacks. They are pretty aggressively focused. Uh, we had a lot of fun in playtests and stuff running all three of the Wolverines together and kind of making that Wolverine family team which was uh, pretty enjoyable and led to a lot of carnage uh, on the tabletop. But it was a nice, it was definitely a nice different way to play, a little more aggressively focused. You can always bring Laura in as kind of a slightly cheaper Wolverine option as well because she is a slightly lower threat than Logan. We wanted to make sure that there was Interesting choices to be made between the two characters and that they filled kind of similar but different roles. That's one of the biggest things about looking at characters that kind of are close. How do you make them different? How do you make them interesting choices between each other? And of course, Honey Badger, I think, will just be uh, extraordinarily popular because she will be the first threat to mutant that is not Toad. So... She will open up some uh, cool list building and roster construction abilities for not Brotherhood or Brotherhood too, I guess, if you want to run her in Brotherhood. I could see her having a pretty good role home with Mystique, but she would not be affiliated, of course. So yeah, overall, you know, there's a lot of really cool kind of stuff coming that will, I think, reinvigorate and allow Uncanny X-Men and even X-Force to some extent. Um, some of those characters will transfer over to Cable's team as well. Uh, ask some new questions, pose some, pose some new answers to things that maybe have been a little tough. And as we always talk about, it's one of the joys of working on a game that is constantly expanding and growing is that you plant seeds and then in the future you get to kind of see them bear fruit. Sometimes things grow in a way that you didn't expect, but that works out really well. You know, there's always that statement that it's great to be lucky as well as skilled, and we do benefit from that every once in a while. Um, but it's a lot of curation, it's a lot of watching and making sure that everything kind of works together to always create an exciting and robust game experience. And I think the biggest challenge that we always run into, you know, because it's a game and it needs to be a balanced and uh, quote-unquote fair experience, and I put it fair in quotes because everyone's definition of fair can be very, very different. So when I say fair, I mean, you know, everything is within certain parameters of each other. We talk about the balance curve a lot and how we try to keep the ends close but obviously not touching because if they're touching, everything's the same and there is no character or flavor and no narrative. And we're playing with characters that are all about, you know, their own shtick and doing things very differently. And so there's never perfect balance. Perfect balance is that ugly term that we don't want uh, to ever really experience because it wouldn't be very fun. And it definitely wouldn't fit the narrative of the Marvel Universe and the stories that we're telling. But the closer they are together, the more player skill, luck, all the other different elements can come together and mess around with it. So, you know, we do watch all of that stuff. Uh, but it is exciting. It's exciting to watch different affiliations, you know, have their growing pains maybe, uh, or have things that they're not particularly great at or things that they are really good at. 
uh, and they kind of dominate other teams at, and then new things come along and they ask different questions and you know, it evolves and changes the meta and all that stuff. Uh, there are no additional head options. There are no really additional options at all in, in this set. So the characters are just the way they are. Uh, I do know that X-23, some of her costumes do have her in a mask, uh, kind of like Winter Soldier mask style. But that was not the costume option that we really picked. That's a, there's a bit of a difference. There's a pretty large difference between those outfits. Um, I'm just thinking about what I want to go to next. Oh, my blue's down. I think I'm actually going to do the skin. I'm going to break my kind of habit here. And uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> yeah, Colossus being able to throw with the fastball special is, is uh, absolutely a new trick that you can make some pretty scary uh, plays with. And definitely opens up Wolverine in a way that he likes. And, you know, those are just some of the, many of the things that we get to kind of experiment with and play with. You know, when we developed Wolverine, we always knew Colossus and Fastball Special was going to be a thing. Um, I think that was one of the fun kind of seeds about Wolverine's adamantium skeleton was we knew he was going to get thrown at people. He was going to be used as a weapon, so adamantium skeleton just makes... Uh, fastball special that much more appealing because now you're throwing a size three instead of a size two plus you're getting all the benefits of a wolverine being thrown at you um, so it's, it's those kinds of things that are that are very fun moments to plant into design in the game and all that stuff as far as the Rock, she's the piece of battlefield debris she's leaping off of, her tactical rock, we'd call it. You could always just not apply the tactical rock to her foot. Um, I would probably encourage you, if that was the way you wanted to go, to make sure that you added something to the foot to kind of stabilize the connection point. And one of the reasons that we like to use battlefield debris or other things is not just to tell the story, as Dallas Kemp always says, set the scene, uh, but it's also, you know, and light of trying to make dynamic poses that are very action-packed and fit the character, like this super lunge pose for Laura, um, to make sure that they're as stable and friendly as possible. And we're always learning new tricks and techniques to, you know, take all of that to the next level. We're never done. We're never done with the experience, just like, you know, the hobbyist is never done learning their craft of painting or assembling or anything like that. We uh, are always seeking to improve and learn and move on to the next thing with more info than we had before. And that's part of the joy of coming to work every day. You know, it's an infinite game for those game theory folks out there. Uh, we're not playing a finite game, we're playing the infinite game. And uh, so, you know, there's no, there's no moment at which we kind of like dust our hands off and say, well, we won. Congratulations, let's all go home. Instead, you know, every day just gets us that much further into where we're trying to go and what our goals are, which is to make the coolest, best miniatures for any game we work on or any character we're doing that we can. Constantly progressing those skills and taking them to the next level, so. But, if you don't like the rock, you don't have to put the rock on there. I've seen some amazing uh, conversions, some simple, some complex, on the Facebook groups and all that. And that's part of the reason why these games are so fun is that you do get to take some ownership and, you know, make these characters truly your own, not just through a paint job, but also through a conversion. Heck, one of my closest friends who I've been playing games with for gosh, over two decades now. We discovered miniatures games pretty much together. He's a, he's a huge Crisis Protocol player. Um, everything he owns, he chops up and turns into a zombie. You know, he was doing Marvel Zombies 
before what if kind of brought those into the limelight and everything that was that was his thing he was like i love the marvel zombies or i'm gonna make them all zombies I was like, please do and so whenever we get the occasion to play a crisis protocol game i always wind up playing against a bunch of zombified versions of the characters i've worked on and it's great it's a blast and he loves it and you know that end of the day that's what matters we have a we have a great time playing the game he has a very unique and personalized Crisis Protocol Force that he's poured his heart and soul into making his own and according to his vision. And I'm just happy that, you know, we as Atomic Mass were able to give him the foundation that he needed to be able to live that dream. Yeah, it's all just a starting point for the hobbyists. Oh, yeah, old man Logan and Dak, and that would kind of complete the Wolverine family at this point, I think. I mean, you could argue that there have been, I don't even know how many clones of X-23 at this point. She's kind of the, they don't clone Wolverine a lot, I've noticed. Ever since they did X-23, they were like, eh, we'd rather just clone X-23 at this point. Um, so if you're wondering why I'm painting all the flesh uh, here, where it's clear that she's wearing a shirt, in the reference and stuff, the top part of her like shirt is mesh. So I'm gonna paint, I'm gonna paint my base layer of flesh here, and then I'm gonna use um, some washing and mix in some grays and blacks with my flesh, and I'm gonna do some glazing to try to make it look like it's mesh. It's kind of the, the goal here. So uh, let's see, what do we got going on? Uh, so what I do with my paints is I do, I have switched over to using a wet palette. Dallas finally got me. Um, so the wet palette helps just keep the, the paint nice and smooth. Uh, it does extend the working time of the paint quite a bit. But I always do add a little bit of water. Uh, I keep my brush, my brush overall uh, damp, not like soaking wet, but damp. So it adds, it adds a little bit of water into the paints as I work it. And then I also add a little bit of water on top of the wet palette just to get it to a smooth flowing consistency. But the nice thing about the wet palette is you can work the paint and you can kind of test it. I'm way off camera, I apologize. Um, the other thing that you can do to test your paint consistency is you can always use your thumb. So I'm just, I'm looking for it now. See, now I'm off camera again. I can't, I can't win here. Um, so you're looking for it to kind of like flow nice and smooth and have good coverage when you're doing stuff like that. Uh, hopefully that, I mean, it's flesh tone on top of flesh tone. It's probably not the best way to, uh, to demonstrate that, but I'll do it again with a different color. So it is really about feel. There's no, there's no perfect formula. There's no magic like three drops of water to two drops of flow aid or whatever you happen to be using to get your paints perfect because every paint is different. And even the same paint, you know, from different bottles can be different because it is a it's a mass manufacturing thing. So every batch is going to have its own like little quirks and oddities. Um, the best thing to do is to just kind of learn to paint by feel, like to thin by feel and use a little bit at a time until you get to that consistency that you want. And depending on the technique, you may want it like looser or, you know, stiffer. If you're dry brushing, you don't want to add a lot of liquid to your paint because you want it to be um, heavier in application. So the dry brushing technique works the best. When you're doing, you know, fine details, you might want it to be a little thinner, all of that stuff. So, okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and now that my hold blue has dried out. I'm going to try something new. I'm going to use this Instacolor uh, black, shadow black, which is a uh, contrast kind of paint. So normally what I do is I take um, probably some decay black uh, or any kind of black of my choice, really. You could do this with anything. And then I would thin it out. As I drop my cap, uh, I would thin it out into a wash, and then I would just wash it over the top of the Holder Blue, but we're going to give this Instacolor a try um, because it should maybe save me a step or two. Or, you know, it won't, and we'll just kind of, you know, make it work as it goes. 
Um, but the goal with the Insta colors or any kind of contrast like paint is that. So this one's really thin, uh, much like a wash. You're just trying, you're gonna stretch this paint over the surface. You're supposed to have a little bit more tooth than a wash, but this one's definitely acting a lot like a wash. This is what, this is how it works when you try things live for sure. Sometimes you have to make little adjustments on the fly. So right now we're kind of just glazing with this. Normally what you want your high contrast paint to do. I'm going to grab some decay black and I'm just going to mix some in. You want, you want translucency, but you also need it. You're like looking for the in-between between between a wash or a glaze and a normal paint. So you're looking for that translucency, but you're also looking for some good coverage. You want the paint to kind of stretch like a transparent film over the surface. And then what the undertone does is it tints the color where the translucency is. So ideally, the darkest colors run into the crevices like a wash. And so they shade where the shadow should be. And then the paint also stretches over the top. And it allows the spots that would be in highlight to be translucent. And if you did it over your gray primer or your white primer or whatever, you would obviously wind up with a gray because white, white and black make gray tones. But blacks look the best, look the most rich, when they have a different color than white underneath them. So uh, blue is kind of the go-to color that I really like to use. I know Dallas uses blue a ton. Uh, but you can use pink, you can use yellow, you can use green, you can use purple. Um, and all of those will kind of shift how your black, the richness of your black, the way it feels. Green blacks are often really good for more sinister kind of uh, evil things. They have a bit of unhealthiness to them because of that green undertone. We kind of see uh, green undertone as sickly. Purples um, can kind of run the gamut of alien, you know, like a purple. A purple is, undertone is really great for a venom, like modern venom colors. Uh, now that he's no longer, you know, old comic book blacks used to just be blues with a little bit of like spot blacks here and there to make them feel black, but old school like 90s Venom was really just blue. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I like blue undertones is it reminds me of that kind of classic comic book coloring. That said, you know, if you look at like a lot of modern Venom in comics, he has a purple undertone. And purple obviously lends a richness to the black, but it also feels very alien. Um, and purple, so purple can be really cool for a, for a black undertone, especially when you're looking at, working at something that you want to feel a little unnatural or a little weird. Uh, painting convocation characters, if you're doing blacks there, using a lot of purples, really spot on. Okay, let's do the boots. So this is gonna take a couple coats, which is Fine, we'll make that work. I'd hoped that our Instacolor would help us knock it out in maybe one go, because I do like to try to finish these to tabletop standard in an hour. But it doesn't always work that way, and that's fine. So we're just going to keep going here. Rocking and rolling on, covering up our blues to get our blacks going. Where I think that Instacolor is really going to come in handy, though, is it might make a great, it might make a great glaze over our skin tone to give us that mesh top. That's kind of like the uh, top of the shirt and the sleeves and stuff for her mesh. So we'll play with that a little bit, and that might be the ticket. It might not work great over this holder blue, but it might work great over the skin, and we'll just play with that and see where we go. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, like for chat, uh, talking about hood. Uh, sploosh in real life. 
Yeah, I think that's one of the that's one of the exciting things for us, you know, for the big fans of Marvel Comics in the studio. Um, in general, is the fact that you, you do get to kind of be ambassadors for characters that might not be as much in the limelight, um, and that's fun. It's fun to to go in and say, okay, well, Hood is a really cool character. He has he has all this history, but he's not super well known, you know, outside of comics and even in even in like cartoon media and stuff like that. Like you don't see a lot of Hood. Um, and so it's it's fun to be able to go in and be like, okay, well, this character's pretty darn cool. Let's uh, let's give them their time to shine here, and kind of showcase them in the game, and and we just get to expand, and it makes the Marvel universe feel, you know, it makes the Marvel universe feel that much more real and alive, because it is robust and it's full of these characters at different power levels and you know they all have these different wants and needs not every villain is a thanos and not every hero is captain america right like and so getting to kind of explore and play with those ideas um, and those different levels of the marvel universe just makes it more robust makes it more feel more real and uh, and it's fun. It was one of the big reasons why Crossbones has like this really kind of minor role uh, in the MCU. But he's like one of those characters that him and Taskmaster they show up everywhere in the Marvel comics because they're mercenaries. And um, and so you know like when you think about well you want to have this kind of good versus versus bad throw down in the core set so that people can play like really canonically but they can also start mixing and matching who do you want to throw in for that you know and at the time it was like Zemo is such an iconic Captain America antagonist and Crossbones is another one that I think is just so good and is kind of like everywhere that they were easy includes even though people were you know some people were like well I don't know these characters like maybe we should put in somebody else no, let, let people explore. Let people find new loves, right? For some of us, everything that we've seen in the MCU over the last, what is it now, 12, 15 years, whatever, however long it's been, was all new. So let the characters stand on their own and you know be exciting to people and have their moments. I think that's just part of the one of the perks of getting to do what we do especially as um, several of us have spent a lot of chunk of our lives and time reading Marvel comics and enjoying those characters Yeah, and then Crossbones, of course, has been the key ingredient that Dallas Kemp never knew he needed to win games of Marvel Crisis Protocol. So there's that, too. I mean, goodness gracious. He's been on fire. I'm kind of afraid for the next time I get to match up against one Dallas Kemp uh, and his Crossbones. Because I feel like that's really the... My black is all clogged. That's really the... Was the missing ingredient? I don't think he's lost since Crossbones has been in his list. He's just been unstoppable. But I love me some Crossbones. And the addition of the uh, illicit tech card only makes me love him more. I'm just going to mix in, I'm just mixing in the Resurrection Flesh with some Decay Black, and then I'm going to go over kind of this part, and I see that my paint hadn't quite dried, but that's okay. And so hopefully you can kind of see how through this glazing process and kind of doing the darker colors, 
we're just kind of working in the idea that the fabric is stretched and sheer, and so you have the tint of the black mesh over the top of the skin, um, but you still have like the skin going on as well. And this technique really, if you, is very similar to how you would do like a five o'clock shadow on a, on a male character or a, you know, um, a dude's face or somebody who would have a five o'clock shadow. Doesn't necessarily have to be a dude, could be anyone. Many people have the capacity, maybe it's an alien that's just, you know, kind of stubbly. Um, so, it's, it's the exact same idea where you're mixing in those grays and blacks into your flesh tones and you're building up this kind of gradient where you can kind of see what's underneath, but also there's a bit of what's on top. So you can kind of, I think there, we're getting close and this is gonna be a little rough because we do wanna kind of finish this in an hour, but you can obviously take a lot of time, do a lot of highlighting, um, do more and more stuff with it and really get it to be quite fabulous. Uh, one of the best ways to do that, obviously, is time, patience, and multiple glazes. So the more glazing that you do, the better and smoother your results will be. But glazing is one of those things that it is, it's all about the patience. You know, you can't, you can't rush a great glaze. It's going to take multiple coats because you've got to keep it nice and thin because you want to keep that translucency. All right, well, sir, this purity white has failed me. I'm gonna move over to white white, which is fine. Hopefully this one, there we go. All right, need to get a needle, needle to unclog this stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna take a little bit of Miskatana gray. I'm gonna take some Blanco. Uh, I was gonna use purity white from the fantasy and scale color, but I'm just using the regular scale color white. I'm going to mix those two together to kind of create my white base. That's pretty good. And then we're just going to come in and we're going to start knocking out the white portion of the outfit. And white is another one where, much like yellow or any of the lighter colors, you know, oranges stuff, white doesn't have amazing coverage. So your best bet when painting white is to not, A, to not paint white, um, because true, like pure whites are really rare in the real world. Mostly what you see is the white shadows. And so you wanna really focus on the shading of white. So I chose the Miskatana Gray, which has a little bit of blue in it. That will play nicely um, with the blue undertone that we used for the blacks, and then it lets us build up. Um, one of the colors that I really like to use from scale is, uh, oh my gosh, I just, I just lost the name of it. Uh, it is not in front of me either. Uh, I think it's ice blue. It's a very nice blue white. Um, so it's, it's got a lot of blue tinge to it, covers really nicely, and it makes for a great, uh, a great base coat for blue tinged whites, which again, look really nice next to you know, blue tinged blacks because you have that kind of combination going on. So that can be a really great way to do it. You can also just mix. So like here I took the um, Miskatonic Gray mixed it with a little white, thinned it out. We'll do a couple coats of this and it'll pull it together really nice. But much like with yellow, where you shouldn't start by painting pure yellow, you don't wanna paint primary yellow first. You wanna paint, you know, uh, like a yellow ochre is always a great place to start. Find a yellow brown and, and go from there. I've heard a lot of great things about starting your yellows with pink. Have not done that. Um, Someday I will try it because I'm fascinated by this idea where you paint something completely pink and then you hit it with yellow and it turns out to be this amazingly bright, like perfect yellow. So I am, I am fascinated by this. Um, 
but yeah, so start, start with a color that has better coverage and then build up from there. Um, because if you start with kind of the highlight color, which you want the least of anyway, because you're mostly looking with bright colors, you're mostly seeing their shadows. Uh, you're gonna, it's gonna take a long time, it's gonna be kind of frustrating, you're never gonna get really smooth results. So find your mid-tone, or even a little bit below the mid-tone, and then build your way up, and it's gonna be a lot quicker and a lot easier. So. Yeah, so for those wondering, X23, the clone, the clone, a female clone of Wolverine, uh, but primarily referred to as Wolverine's daughter. They have a pretty close relationship. If you watch the fantastic Logan movie, Laura's in that as well, although uh, at a much younger age. It's definitely a different telling of the story, but that's where all the inspiration comes from. Laura is created by the Weapon X program in a lab as part of their ever ongoing efforts to create the perfect weapon. After their ultimate success slash failure with Wolverine himself. And then because that's not good enough, uh, they then took clone Laura and they cloned her again and they created Gabby who took on the name Honey Badger. And of course, Laura uh, rescued Gabby from the program and they've been living as sisters ever since. And Gabby is adorable. Okay. <laughs> you know, the 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 claw thing is, is kind of interesting. It does remind me of um, multiplicity where you make a copy of a copy and things get changed. So Laura, of course, has two claws, but she also has foot claws. So to be fair, um, the third claw is just in a different spot, which makes her more dangerous, I guess, because she can claw kick you as well, which is pretty cool. So it kind of breaks down because Gabby has one claw. Gabby also, important to note, doesn't have adamantium bonded to her. Um, so her claws are just the bone claw. And, uh, but she does have the foot claws. So, you know. Um, and I do believe that somebody, so when BK posted the announcement for these two characters, um, the, uh, store page or the gallery page with all of the card info and stuff went up as well um, so if you haven't checked that out and you want to see like what the team tactic cards and stuff are that come with this pack at least the names of the team tactic cards um, are you can check it out one of them i did see some people freaking out over because if you read the x23 comic runs and know about honey badger and stuff there's also they've uh, Gabby has adopted a real-life Wolverine, which she has named Jonathan the Unstoppable. Uh, and Jonathan the Unstoppable, much like Bats the Ghost Hound, uh, is going to make an appearance in Marvel Crisis Protocol as a Team Tactic card. And so if you look at the box contents, you will see that Jonathan the Unstoppable is included as one of the Team Tactic cards that comes with this set. Uh, it was the only way I could get Josh to stop bothering me every morning for three hours about how we had to make Jonathan the Unstoppable if we were going to make these characters. So we compromised, uh, much like we did with Bats the Ghost Hound. And we made him a Team Tactic card, and let me tell you, doing the Animal Like Friends Team Tactic cards is always a riot. It is wild and crazy, and Jonathan the Unstoppable um, should be terrorizing plenty of tables alongside his flatmates, Laura and Gabby. 
<laughs> and I think that's the other, you know, we talk about design and development and stuff, like what do you work on, what's challenging? A lot of the times it's kind of figuring out how, again, to make that universe feel as wild and robust as possible, but there's probably not really a whole lot of place for Jonathan the Wolverine as a character pack or Bats the Ghost Hound. So how do you, how do you approach characters like that? What, what do you do to make them feel meaningful and fun and fill everything? Oh, now I have to find a metallic color. Well, that bottle is just empty. What about this one? That's gold, and we're not gonna paint her with gold claws. Uh, -der 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 -der. Seriously? Somebody's gotta learn to put these paints away better. I blame Dallas Kemp. It's clearly his fault. Ah, oh, there we go. I think he took a bunch of them because he was working on that studio paint last week. So he probably grabbed them and pulled them to his desk. <laughs> Bob, Bob's not, I don't think, I don't think I would compare, if you're talking about Bob, agent of Hydra Bob, excuse me, uh, I would absolutely not put Bob in the same realm as Bats the Ghost Hound or Jonathan the Unstoppable. That's just me, but. I feel like Bob, Bob is, you know, a bit more robust than, say, the Pet Avengers. And let's be honest, you know, I see people screaming about Throg. Uh, very exciting. I would say that Throg is a bit more robust like, like a Bob than, let's say, a Bats. You know, Bats, Bats the Ghost Hound is important, but he doesn't really leave the compound. He's not, he's not going out and, you know, doing a, a bunch of the heavy lifting. Kind of similar to Jonathan. Jonathan's there, he hangs out, but he's not driving the story. Bob has most certainly driven story, as has Throg. You know, maybe that's a weird way to draw the distinction. I don't know, that's how I'm gonna draw the distinction though, so this is where we're at, I guess. Uh, where'd my decay black go? No. There it is. I hadn't had my water. On a scale from bats to throg, where would I put spider ham? Oh my gosh. I feel like this is a trap. Uh, I mean, I, I think spider ham has got to be pretty close to throg, right? He's definitely no bats. He, a spider ham has some pretty important agency in all of the stories. Yeah, I mean, for crying out loud, he's he has his own he has his own series. To my knowledge, and I could be wrong about this, but to my knowledge, I do not know of a Bats the Ghost Hound comic arc. Like, I don't think Bats has ever starred as his own the star of his own run. Now he might be the star in your heart, and that is one hundred percent acceptable. But, you know, he's, he's never been a, I don't believe that there is a, you know, the, the spooktacular bats, the ghost hound, issue one through six. You know, there's no mini series arc. Josh is at home right now getting a nosebleed because he knows. He's no Bessie the Hellcow, let's be honest. Bessie the Hellcow. That girl has shaken the Marvel Universe to its core at times. And speaking of bats, I do know that I believe the U.S. finally 
uh, has access to all the convocation stuff, which is very exciting. Um, I've seen a lot of people posting pictures of the kits, the packs that they've purchased, which is super cool. And can't tell you how much of a relief it is for everyone to finally get their hands on that stuff. There's still more stuff to go, obviously. But everyone in Asmodee Logistics and shipping and all that stuff kind of breathes a big sigh of release every time we finally get to that end point these days because, man, it's, it's tough. So much going on in the world right now and all the challenges that everyone's facing. I'm just excited that everyone gets to come hang out with us, that we get to do this, do some hobbying to talk about you know, how to play that infinite game that is personal improvement through the hobby and everything that we do, everything that you get to do at home, building your skills, having fun, enjoying each other where we can. I've seen a lot of communities being able to get back together for the first time in a while. sure folks will start uh, running maybe an Infinity War campaign or something with the print and play, maybe a Vibranium heist. If you happen to not be able to participate in those, like we talked about at the front, if you missed it, one of the really exciting things we got to talk about today was the fact that we are posting the first two organized play kits as print and play options for folks to download and use. All the game materials will be available from them. Um, we're pretty excited to be able to do that. And future organized play kits will wind up being posted as print and play options as well. It's the plan going forward. But, you know, there'll be a, quite a bit of time in between to allow stores the opportunity to run those those kits and be kind of the front and center of the excitement. So if you want to get everything in print, if you want to get the cool limited edition alternate art cards, if you want to just enjoy the company of your Marvel Crisis Protocol community, absolutely go find the local game store, whoever's running it. But we know that not everyone has that opportunity for whatever reason. And, oh, we're going to have a white-haired Laura. I'm going to have to go back and punch up that black, I think. Um, so by kind of splitting the difference and offering the play materials as print and play 12 to 18 months after the kits are released, you know, for those who, or you join, you know, you joined Crisis Protocol in the last six months. Heck, you're going to, you're going to have missed out on a couple of those really fun events because you just, you're new to the game. That's no fault of yours. Community is always growing and that's our goal. More people are finding the game. People are excited by it. I want to make sure that you're getting the maximum value out of your collection that you're building up as well. So this is how we're hoping to, to be able to do that and make everything work. What time is it? <gasps> we got 11 minutos. So I think we'll get, we will achieve our goal of getting Laura to a nice general tabletop standard in an hour, which is always my goal when I do these. Just to kind of show what is possible in a short amount of time because not everybody can hang out, not everybody can or wants to hang out and you know, work on a character for three, four, or five hours. Sometimes you just want to get paint on them so they look cool and get them to the tabletop so you can start throwing cars and beating people up. So there's like, kind of showing what's possible and then also not sweating the small stuff. Like the destiny of this miniature is just to get on the table and look cool. So there are some things that I would probably wind up doing beyond what I will finish here. You know, I'd add a little wash to the skin. I might like pick out the face details a little bit more. Um, but overall, 
This is a miniature that I would be pretty satisfied with throwing on a table for a friendly game. Because that is the destiny, as Dallas Kemp likes to say, that I've picked out for this specific miniature. She's just meant to go on the table. She will probably wind up uh, filling out some of our playtest ranks, to be honest. It's where a lot of my stream characters go as they end up becoming heavy use gameplay miniatures because we always like to play test with real miniatures. You get the true game experience as much as possible. And part of that is, you know, of course, playing with uh, these characters and all that. I'll do one more glaze over skin mesh here just because I think we can add a little bit more to it Make it good but you know when you know that that's the case right it's like okay does it look good from the three foot test if it does then I'm very happy and we have nailed it well we have a nice like we got that nice blue black it's got some shift our whites are looking pretty good we could add a little bit of shadow in there maybe but I think it's looking Pretty solid for where we're at. Skin tone all works and everything. That's true, we all know the painted models roll better. There's no question, or painted miniatures in this case. Chat. Don't go paint, don't go paint in a model. I don't think they like that. You know, models are people too. Unless your job, you know, if the photo shoot is to paint, to paint the model, then I guess it's fine. But you just randomly find a model on the street. Don't, don't paint them, please. Paint the miniatures. Paint the miniatures, not the models. That's going to be my very confusing but super pragmatic and uh, honest plea on my shirt. All right, I'm just kind of screwing around here for the last couple of minutes. Going back over that harvester flesh just to pick it out just a little bit more. Again, I think the only thing that I'm missing, and it is my one gripe with the paints that we have available to us, is that we don't really have a great flesh wash that's pre-mixed. So I'm not going to be able to hit the... Uh, shade today. Normally I have my, like, Vallejo makes an okay one. Um, a bunch of different options. But I don't really have anything of access to me right now, so we'll just leave it without the shade and it'll be fine. Uh, do we have one more? One more what? Is that, it? is this it for reveals? Uh, yeah, this is the last this is the last, uh, these are the last miniatures to be revealed this year. This is it. There are no more miniatures to reveal. Um, you know, like I, like I mentioned, everybody's going on break. Boo! My goodness. My goodness. I can't even, I can't even begin to count how many miniatures so far we've revealed this year. And we end, we end with two more. And I'm getting booed. Jeez. Jeez. Hurts my heart. Hurts my heart. It's fine. We got a whole other year. We're going to be back. We're going to be back real shortly. And, uh, you know, there's, there's probably going to be more. And, heck, who knows what else BK has in store for you. You know, we make... We do more things than just miniatures. Let's try this. We're gonna be really bold here because I, I really wanna get some shadowing into her, into her flesh, so. I took some Demon Brown, which is an Insta-Color. I thinned it out pretty good. And we're just gonna see if this'll kinda help. I picked this one because it's got a ruddy tone to it. So it'll give you, it'll give us that, like most flesh tones, you know, they've got, they got a little red, they got a little orange, or a little red, a little green, in terms of the brown. 
and uh, I'm hoping that this demon, this demon brown here kind of looked like it had some of those elements. Not exactly. It's not, I don't, I don't think it's a perfect replacement, but I think it's close enough that it will give us that kind of ruddy skin tone shade that we're looking for. And then with a little bit of highlighting, if we wanted to go back, we could kind of like clean it up. But yes, there will be more, never fear. We have so many more plans, so much more cool stuff. Uh, you know, for you, you're gonna be seeing stuff in 2022. Uh, for us, when we come back to work, we're gonna be working in 2024. So, <laughs> um, there's always more yet to be revealed. As long as we're showing up every day and hanging out with you all during the streams and stuff and talking about whatever's next for you all to get in your hands, you can know that there's at least 18 to 24 months more worth of stuff that we haven't even, that we haven't even hinted at. Uh, and for those, somebody's asking, um, Richmond Game of X23 and Honey Badger be released alongside the other mutant packs. Uh, that is that is currently the plan. That these characters will release alongside Colossus Magic, Juggernaut, Rogue Gambit. I feel like I'm missing one, and I probably am. There's so many things. Um, but they will be released in that same wave alongside those characters. At least that's the plan. Global shipping being what it is, um, we'll cross our fingers, say our prayers that that remains to be the case. Um, but BK, myself, Dallas, everyone else at AMG who's on the streams will let you all know as soon as we know stuff, if things change or what to expect. All right, there, that gave us a little bit of life and color into that skin. Now it's looking, now it's looking nice and robust. So with that said, I think this one hour tabletop ready paint job for X23 it is a success. I call it a success. What a way to go out on the year. Ready to go. Uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for those of you who've been tuning in with us throughout the year. We've had a blast hanging out with you. Uh, and I can't wait to do it again next year. Of course, we still have two more streams to go before we close up shop for the rest of 2021. And that's going to be tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific. Join Dallas Kemp. He's going to be painting a Razor Crest for X-Wing. And then on Thursday, we're going to be playing uh, X-Wing. We're going to be showing off the finalized core rules for the 2.5 system, uh, which will be released later next year. We'll talk a lot more about that, so be sure to tune into that if you have any interest in that stuff. Otherwise, if you're here for the Marvel Crisis Protocol, this is it. Hope you're as excited for these two characters as we are uh, and have been to create them. And we're looking forward to seeing you all next year. We'll be right back in January, same, ba uh, same time, same channel. Uh, and otherwise, take care, everyone. And have a wonderful end of your year. Goodbye.